Chapter 18 of the Westminster Confession has to do with the assurance of grace and salvation. So we've been talking quite a bit about uh, what we do now. So we've talked about the monergistic work of God in the calling and justification and adopting. And now we are talking, you know, we've been talking about sanctification, saving faith, repentance, good works, uh, the perseverance of the saints. And so all of that is, is funneling into uh, this, this point here, the assurance of our salvation. So um, if all, all the previous things are present, if you're able to detect those within your life, then that should rightly lead us to uh, a, a right understanding of our assurance. Um, there's a reason why assurance of salvation wasn't put at the beginning, uh, because you really have to have all these other pieces in place in order to have a, a, a sure of, and a firm assurance and a biblical based assurance. Uh, we, the confession recognizes that, that there are actually four types of assurance in, uh, in the world. And, uh, and actually Dr. Sproul is one who um, outlines these and I just wanna write them up here. Um, so there are those who are saved and know it. So that's the, the person, you know, maybe the lifelong Christian who uh, has you know, gone through all the ups and downs and the battles of a person of very mature faith. Um, you know, doesn't have to be necessarily a lifelong Christian, but certainly someone who is very mature in their faith. They, they recognize God's presence in their life. They know that they're redeemed um, and they know that, that they are saved. Now, there are those who are saved and don't know it. So these are the elect that are in the world uh, who haven't heard the outward call of the gospel. They, God is recognizing them as, as the elect, but as we talked about when we talked about justification um, and, and how God works, it's 99.99% of the time the inward call of the gospel is attended to by the outward call of the gospel. But not only that, there, these could be people who are in churches who are listening to the gospel, but perhaps just are, are weak in their faith, uh, not quite mature in their faith. And so their assurance of their own salvation might be low. Uh, and so that's the role of the church to help build it up. So it's people who are saved, but don't, don't really know it or, or don't have the assurance of it. And then there's a third group who are unsaved and know it. So, you know, this is the, the staunch atheist, the, the person who uh, is, uh, is perhaps of another religion. They're, they're, they're adamant about their, their Buddhism or, or whatever. They, they care nothing about the God of the Bible. They care nothing about the Jesus, uh, the Messiah. Uh, they don't want anything to do with him. They don't care if they're unsaved or whatever we, what language we use. And they're fine with that. They know it. They know that they're not part of this, the, the, the Christian system. Now, the fourth category, which is probably the most problematic, are the unsaved and don't know it. These are the group of people who are in the church who think they're saved, but are not. And so they're unsaved and they're perhaps taking leadership roles within the church or perhaps leading in false doctrines and false teachings. Um, they are unsaved and don't know it. And unfortunately, this is the group that is probably the most hard to recognize, but also the, because of that, it's, it's hard, to, um, hard to, to police and hard to uh, shepherd. And so the, having a proper sense of our assurance, the goal is to have every Christian here. Every Christian should know that he or she is saved. Uh, that's that's the, the goal. Now, of course, like I said, that and, and we'll read in our, in our confession that that will vacillate and that will, will come and go uh, as, you know, as life as life demands. But that's that's the end goal. The end goal is to have every hey, have every Christian know that he or she is saved. That's all right. Come on in. Well, we, we just got started, and I was just lifting here. We're talking about the assurance of salvation, and these are four types of people who, who have some sort of assurance of their salvation. Uh, the ones who, who are saved, and they know it. The ones who are saved and don't know it. The ones who are unsaved and know it. 
and the ones who are unsaved and don't know it. So we, we've sort of just listed up here. Dr. Sproul is the one who gave us this, these um, breakdown, and we're going to talk a little bit about them, but I just wanted to throw that up there as a way of thinking. Like I was just saying, the goal is to have every Christian come to this point, that they recognize that they are saved and, and they know it, that, they, that they're saved and they know that they are saved. Um, and that's what shepherding and discipleship is, is all about. Because again, like I said, we'll see how that's not always, um, always present. So the first article here <coughs> reads, although hypocrites and other unregenerate men may vainly deceive themselves with false hopes and carnal presumptions of being in the favor of God and a state of salvation, which hope of theirs shall perish. Yet such as truly believe in the Lord Jesus and love him in sincerity, endeavoring to walk in all good conscience before him, may in this life be certainly assured that they are in the state of grace and may rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, which hope shall never make them ashamed. So right off the bat, the Westminster divines begin by addressing this problematic group, the unsaved who don't know it. I'm talking about here the hypocrites and unregenerate who vainly deceive themselves uh, of being in favor of God. Uh, in Micah chapter 3, and, and many of the minor prophets, and perhaps most of them, actually most all the prophets, echo here what Micah summarizes uh, in chapter 3, verse 9. Here he says, Now hear this, heads of the house of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel. So he's talking to those who um, are, are you know, the, the tribal heads of Israel. These are the folks who, who should rightly know God and should rightly understand God's commands and God's uh, precepts that are upon their, their lives uh, and, upon, and for their clans and everything. So Micah is talking to them. Now hear this, heads of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel, who abhor justice and twist everything that is straight. So he calls them out on what they're doing. They abhor justice and they twist everything that is straight. Who build Zion with bloodshed and Jerusalem with violent injustice. Uh, so clearly they act, uh, 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 they persecute their own people. They are uh, acting violently against, uh, against their own. Her leaders pronounce judgment for bribe. Her priests instruct for price and her prophets divine for money. So here the Micah just lists all three offices, which of course, those are the offices that Jesus uh, rightly fills. Uh, that of the kings, of the leaders, they pronounce judgment for a bribe. So, you know, the rulers are for hire. Uh, the priests instruct for a price. Uh, the, if you pay the right money, the priest is gonna say that special blessing for you, or he'll, he'll preach the word that you want to hear rather than what you need to hear. And the prophets divine for money. They'll, they'll tell you all the good things that are come your way if you give them a couple bucks. And so here was what, what Micah is, uh, is essentially condemning all, you know, again, all three offices. Yet, and this is the problem. I mean, that's a problem. That is a problem. But this is, this is worse for Micah. Yet they lean on the Lord, saying, is not the Lord in our midst? Calamity will not come upon us. And so they, they do all these terrible things. They, they perpetuate injustice. They, they take bribes. And at the same time, they, they, claim, they claim that God is on their side, that, that God is going to preserve them from calamity, that, that God would never let anything bad happen to them. And so Micah says, therefore, on account of you, so talking to these hypocrites, these leaders who are, are taking bribes, who are, who are doing injustice, on account of you, Zion will be plowed as a field, Jerusalem will become a heap of ruins, and the mountain of the temple will become high places of a forest. So essentially, you know, he's talking there about the, the exile um, and, and the destruction there. But the main point here is these are folks, you know, those three offices, the prophets, the priests, and the kings. These are the three anointed offices that God has instituted to lead Israel in her, in her worship and in her right relationship with God. And yet it is these three people, these three groups of people who are out there doing everything opposite of what God wants them to do. And so they have a false sense of assurance. Uh, and, and we see very clearly that they had a false sense of assurance, that they believed God was on their side, that God would not bring them calamity, even though they are out there doing things that God very clearly finds abhorrent. 
and finds as sinful. Uh, Jesus picks up on something, on, on something similar, and I've mentioned this verse and chapter before in other places, but here again, Matthew chapter 7, verses 21, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? You know, we did all things. We, we had the assurance that, that of our faith. We had the assurance of doing the good works. We had all this good, the assurance. And then I will declare to them, says Jesus, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So there are very clearly groups of people who are unsaved, who are unredeemed, who, are, who don't know it, who think that they have an assurance of salvation, but they don't have it actually. And that's why that's a problem. Because as we see, like I pointed out, just in Micah alone, how the, the three offices led all of Israel astray. You know, it wasn't just that God exiled the prophets, priests, and kings. He destroyed the whole country. All of Jerusalem was laid to waste because of their hypo hypocrisy. And the same thing happens in the church. If we allow uh, our leaders, if we allow our elders to, uh, to believe, to have a false sense of assurance, that's going to lead the whole church astray. That, if, if a church submits to that false teaching and allows those false doctrines to perpetuate, that will lead the whole church astray. It's not just something that will affect the, the pastor, it'll affect the whole congregation. Um, and so we see here that, that we do need to have a right assurance and a right proper understanding of our assurance. Now, true believers, so that they jump from those who, who don't have a right understanding, true believers, they say, may in this life be certainly assured. So there is a certainty that's there. Um, they, and they list it out in, uh, in a few ways here, in a couple of ways. First, true believers love the Lord Jesus in sincerity. So that's one way that we are sure that we can have, a, that we can be certainly assured. And of course, we, we see this in, uh, in the Gospels and in the New Testament. John, in John, the Gospel of John, chapter 14, Jesus says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. There's assurance there. If we love God, if we love Jesus, we will keep his commandments. So if we keep his commandments out of love and we, we, we're not, uh, um, we're not, what's the word? I just lost it. Uh, we're not begrudgingly following what he asks us. If, if, if we're not, uh, you know, oh, do I have to do that, God? <laughs> you know, if, if, we, if we love uh, to, to obey and we love to follow him, that's right there should assure us. You know, we, if we didn't love God, we wouldn't love to, to follow him. We wouldn't love to, to obey him. And that's what Jesus is getting. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. It's because there's that, that love relationship is there. If you don't love God, you're going to not love keeping his commandments. You're going to struggle. And by struggle, I mean you, you're, we're all going to struggle in the sense of we're all going to fall short of it. But if we hate his commandments, if we hate following, if we read the Bible and we hate what we're hearing, it's likely then that we don't have a full assurance or we're not actually uh, redeemed. And so we have to remedy that. Uh, same author, in this case it's, the, it's John, but he's writing in 1 John chapter 2. He says, by this we know that we have come to know him. So again, he's just taking what Jesus has said and has expanded it to, to you know, talking more plurally here. But this we know that we have come to know him. So if we come to know God, we know this if we keep his commandments. So there again, there's this notion that um, we can have an assurance that we know God if we love and, and want to follow his commands. And I, we talked about this when it comes, when, it, when we talked about the sin and sanctification. Paul was wrestling with that in Romans chapter 7. Remember we talked where he says, I do what I don't want to do, and I, I know I need to follow the law, but I, I can't do it, I don't want to do it, or the flesh, and he, he talks about that spiritual battle. The point of that is, a Christian, a believer, would not struggle. Let me make sure I'm saying this right. A, a, a person, excuse me, a person would not struggle if they weren't a believer. So if, if, a, if an unregenerate person saw that there was sin in their life, they would love it. They would continue to do, oh, that's the way I am. That's, I, it makes me happy. I love doing these things. I don't want to change. All that. An unregenerate person sees the sin that's in their life and say, oh, I'm fine with that. 
I'm not, I'm not hurting anyone. It's just me. Um, you know, they'll, they'll make excuses. The believer, when he sees the sin that's in his life, as Paul did, will, will wrestle with it. And will say, why is this in here? Why, why, am I, why am I doing this? Why do I, I know what God wants me to do. Why do I keep doing this other thing? A believer should struggle with that. If we're not struggling with that, there again is that, that there's probably a, a, either a false sense of assurance or there is no salvation at all. When we see the sin that's in our lives and, and we know Jesus' commands, when we hear his commands and we wrestle with that, that's a good sign because that means we're, we're actually listening to it and we're trying to, to, you know, all right, trying to get it. Now, now when we hear it, again, if we hear the commands and we say, oh, I'm not doing that, I need to change, that's a good thing. But if we hear the commands and say, I don't like that, let me change the Bible, that's a bad thing. That's not how you, you, you can't work around. That's, that's essentially doing the same thing of, of I, you know, I love my sin, I don't want to change. If you try to make loopholes in the system or you try to reinterpret something, that's wrong. That's not the way. When, you, when we recognize that there is a sin or when, when there's a command that's been given to us and we struggle with it, that struggle is fine, but we need to struggle to do it and recognize that it might take a while for us to get there, but we need to change our, our old way and pursue the, the, the commandment. If we're trying to change the commandment, ignore the commandment, or, or bypass anything, that's wrong. That's, that is a false assurance of our salvation. A little later in 1 John, uh, the apostle will say in chapter 3, verse 18, little children, let us not love with word or with tongue. So we don't, don't just say, don't just uh, profess what we have, uh, our faith, we need to possess it. But in deed and in truth, let us love in deed and in truth. We will know this, that we are of the truth, and will assure our heart before him. Oh, excuse me, we'll know by this. So when we, when we not only profess our faith, because he does want us to profess, you know, let us not love a word and tongue alone in that sense. Uh, we need to profess our faith, but we also need to possess it. We need to truly live out the love that, that, that we have, the love for God and the love for neighbor. And when we do that, when, and when we do it willingly and lovingly, you know, we should love to love God with our whole hearts. We should love to love our neighbors we love ourselves. Again, if we're doing it begrudgingly, there's a problem. But if we're doing it out of love, that right there, is, as John says, by this we will know and, and have an assure, assure our hearts uh, before God. So that's the first part there. So true believers love the Lord Jesus in sincerity. And the second part the divines mentions, true believers are endeavoring to walk in all good conscience. So the, the believer uh, recognizes and loves Jesus and loves his commands. And now not only does he love it intellectually, the believer wants to endeavor to do it, wants to endeavor in good conscience to do it. Again, good conscience is the key word. If you're endeavoring to follow God's law begrudgingly, that's not in good conscience. Uh, in good conscience, you want to do it willingly. You want to do it lovingly. Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 says, for our proud confidence is this. So I mean, Paul doesn't like boasting, but that's not entirely true. He likes boasting, but he likes to boast in the right and the proper places. So this is one of those instances. Our proud confidence is this, the testimony of our conscience that in holiness and godly sincerity, not in fleshly wisdom, but in the grace of God, we have conducted ourselves in the world and especially toward you. So when we do our good works, it's not according to, to fleshly wisdom. It's not according to our own desires. It's not according to a begrudging thoughts. Rather, it is done in, in, uh, in the grace of God, recognizing that God has given us the ability to do these good works. And that's the testimony of Paul's conscience, uh, that in holiness and godly sincerity, they have conducted themselves in the world, that Paul has conducted himself, that the church has uh, in Corinth has conducted itself uh, in, in the world in holiness and godly sincerity. And that should be on our hearts too. We should recognize again, uh, endeavor to, to live in holiness and godliness. James says something similar in chapter two. He says, uh, but someone will, may, say, may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? So here again, James recognizes 
that uh, we must be able to endeavor to, to live out our faith. You know, we, we have the intellectual assent of who God is, but faith is more than just assent. It's actually living into and submitting to that trust and that obedience. Uh, it takes more than just head knowledge. It's a whole heart and body relationship. Um, and, and here again mentioned the, the Westminster Divines talked about it as a state of grace. That's important to recognize, to, to mention that. Um, you know, we might talk about in science, we, we talk about states of matter. You know, so like there's a liquid, gas, um, solid. solid. I was like, what's the other one? Liquid, gases, these are states of matter. Those are pretty objective. You know, the molecules in a state that's solid, they're not moving as much. You know, that's what makes it solid. They're, they're there. But, a, but a, a, a fluid, the, the molecules are moving pretty, you know, fluidly. And so here, that's, a, that's an objective state. You can look at that, you can observe it, and you can recognize, all right, I know that an ice cube is, is solid, and I know that vapor is gas, and I know water running out of my faucet is liquid. And so, but it's all the same, you know, H2O. It's objective, you can observe it. State, the state of grace is also objective in us. God, again, we talk about this, this is all God's work. God is the one who redeems, God is the one who justifies, God is the one who gives us faith, God is the one who tells us what our good works uh, are and what's pleasing to him. It's God who gives us the Holy Spirit to, to sanctify us, to mortify our, our sin. You know, all of these things, we, the things that we do participate in, we participate in, but we can't even participate in those without God first doing it, first nudging us. And so we see that God is working in this. So when we talk about a state of grace, Grace is an objective reality. If you are born again, if you are a regenerate Christian, if you are one of the elect, one of the redeemed, the objective reality is that you are saved, that you have grace. Now, we don't always feel saved. We don't always, like I said, there's four types of assurance. There's a whole reason why we're talking about assurance, because our assurance of this state of grace is subjective. We might, it might vacillate. We might not feel strong. We might not know that we're saved. Uh, you know, the, the experience of assurance is subjective, but the, the grace is itself objective. If God has redeemed you because of who God is, God is immutable, God is omnipotent, God is, um, is omniscient, God is all, the, all of God's attributes tell us that if God says and does something, guess what? It's said and done. And if God says and God elects you, says you're in a state of grace, guess what? You are in a state of grace. And, we, and that should be our anchor when we think about it. That should be the anchor of our assurance. And what we hold on to when we're, you know, whether we're vacillating in this, uh, we, need to, we need to hold on to that. And so now the divines are going to start talking about um, how, the, the, how it might change. And so, for instance, uh, this next article I've titled, an infallible assurance. So basing it off of God's promise here. This certainty is not a bare conjectural or probable persuasion grounded upon a fallible hope, but an infallible assurance of faith founded upon the divine truth of the promises of salvation, the inward evidence of those graces onto which these promises are made, and the testimony of the spirit of adoption witnessing with our spirits that we are the children of God, which spirit is the earnest of our inheritance, whereby we are sealed to the day of redemption. So here the Westminster divines are, are taking that phrase state of grace and pretty much describing what I just said in that uh, we are, that this assurance is something that is based in God, not something that we do. So for instance, the phrase here, not a bare conjectural or probable persuasion but an infallible assurance of faith. Paul says in Colossians chapter 2, verse 1, uh, For I want you to know how great a struggle I have on your behalf and for those who are at Laodicea and for all those who have not personally seen my face, that their hearts may be encouraged. So he's, he's writing this letter, the letter to the Colossians, writing it as a way of encouragement to the churches there in Asia Minor. Having been knit together in love, attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding. So he recognizes that the churches, in order for them to, 
to really get a hold of the message and to really get a hold of their life uh, in, their, in, the, in the spirit, they, has, they must have a full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery. So when we have, uh, it's, it's not something that we just think about. That's why it says it's not a probable persuasion. It's not conjecture. Our assurance is, is based in the knowledge of God's mystery. Now, I talked about Sunday, what a mystery is in, a Bi- in the Bible. It's not something that's secret that is suddenly made known, and it's not something like a whodunit that you gotta, you gotta figure it out. No, a mystery is something that was once hidden, but is now revealed. So in the Old Testament, something was hidden, and now in the New Covenant, something is revealed, and Paul tells us what that mystery is. It says, resulting in the true knowledge of God's mystery, that is Christ himself, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And so our assurance is not something, again, that we conjecture. It's not something that's probable persuasion. It's based in the promises of Christ. It's based in in the mystery of Christ in the sense that what was previously hidden in the Old Testament has now been revealed in the fullness of Christ as Savior, as Christ as the prophet, priest, and king, as Jesus as our atoning sacrifice, all these things. We can base our assurance in that, not in something that we feel, not in some subjective opinion or experience that we have. We can base our assurance in the cross, that Christ went to the cross, that he was willing to take our sins and die for the church. That is where we can anchor our assurance. That's why that's so important. Well, one of the reasons why it's so important. If if you ignore or deny uh, the crucifixion and the resurrection, you're essentially denying people, or one of the things you're doing is you're denying people their assurance of salvation. Because if, if, if you think that the, the crucifixion didn't happen or the resurrection didn't happen, then your assurance didn't happen. Or where, where's your assurance grounded? It's grounded in something uh, you know, like vapor. <laughs> it's grounded in, in, in vanity. Because we have to know and we have to believe and have to recognize that the crucifixion happened. The resurrection happened. And that right there gives us the assurance. It's not something we experience. It's based in the work of Christ. Now, this assurance is also founded upon the divine truth of the promises. Hebrews, the author of the letter to the Hebrews says, In the same way, God, desiring even more to show to the heirs of the promise the unchangeableness of his purpose. So God, when he, commit, when he covenants something, when he promises something, He doesn't change. He's immutable. Because if God were to promise something and then recant or renege or or come to find out he didn't actually follow through, then that that makes God a liar. And if God is a liar, he's a God that we can't trust, a God who we can't really obey because we don't know. That's that's what baffles me when you think of, especially in Paul's time, the pagan religions that are running around uh, in Rome I mean, just read Greek mythology. You can't trust Zeus. You can't trust uh, Diana. You can't trust uh, uh, Neptune, all these guys, all those Roman and Greek gods, because they they lie, they cheat, they, they, they do dishonest things. How can you trust them? How could you worship them? God is unchangeable in his purpose. Interposed with an oath so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, there the author tells us, We who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast. So the assurance of our salvation, again, is not something based in our experience. It's based in the promises of God, in the unchangeable promises of God. We can have assurance because God is true to his promises. We know that we're not. We know that we fall short. We know that the church falls short of our promises. But we know that God is true. And God is loving. And God is forgiving. And so we can trust and anchor in him. This assurance is also founded upon inward evidences. Now we can come to the point where we can experience it evidentially. 2 Peter chapter 1, here the apostle says, Seeing that his divine power was granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. So God has given to us through the Holy Spirit the power in the sense, not the power is is in the ability. So the ability to to do a godly life, to live a godly life. 
through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. Verse 10, therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. We'll talk about what those, these things are. And we have already talked what they are when we're talking about good works. But we can, so once we have a, an understanding that our assurance is based in the unchanging promises of God, when we recognize that, now we can then look at our life and see, okay, how am I experiencing that assurance? Uh, how, how am I uh, seeing that God has given me the ability to live a godly life and practice these things. How, can, how, do, how do I see that present in my life? So now we can get to sort of the inward evidence. And finally, this assurance is found, I think it's finally, this assurance is, uh, is founded upon the testimony of the spirit of adoption. So here we talked a little bit about what the work of the spirit is. In Romans chapter eight, Paul tells us, for you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again but you have received the spirit of adoption. We talked about this when we talked about adoption. Spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. So if we can indeed experience uh, the evidences of our own assurance, how do we do that? We do that through the Holy Spirit. It's the spirit who tells us. It's the spirit who reveals to us. It's the spirit who shows us our assurance. And not only that, the final article here, the assur this assurance is founded upon the Spirit itself, because the Spirit as, is the earnest of our inheritance. We talked about this before. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1, In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him, so in Christ, with the Holy Spirit. Not just the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit of promise. Verse 14, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. And again, in 2 Corinthians, Paul says, verse chapter 1, 21, now, we, now he who establishes us with you in Christ and anointed us in God, who also sealed us and gave us the spirit in our hearts as a pledge. So remember, we talked about this when we talked about the spirit of adoption. God gives to us, or one of the things that the spirit does when he's given to us by God is he is that down payment, if you will, upon the guarantee of our salvation. And we talked about that. Remember when we, the example I used was, you know, if you're going to go buy a car or a house, a really big purchase, you usually put down a down payment. You're, you're telling the, you know, the seller, hey, I can't afford this whole thing, but I'm going to put down this sum and I promise I will pay off the rest. And that sum is that promise saying, hey, I'm putting, so, I, this is my skin in the game. Here's my, my promise, my guarantee that I will pay off the rest. God is doing the same thing when he redeems us, which again, I talked about that word redeem is economic language. What God, what Christ is doing on the cross when he redeems sinners is he's purchasing sinners. He is paying our debt. And so by that, the Holy Spirit is a down payment, if you will, of that reminder, of that assurance, of that salvation. So those who have received the Holy Spirit can be assured because they have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is, the assur is, is one of those assurances of their salvation. So again, it's infallible in the sense that it is based on God's work. If you are saved, you are saved because it's God's doing and it's God's work. Now it brings us to the third article. Before we get there, are any questions on anything so far? I know there's a lot of overlap, which is a good thing. All right, article three says, this infallible assurance doth not so belong to the essence of faith, but that a true believer may wait long and conflict with many difficulties before he be partaker of it. Yet, being enabled by the Spirit to know the things which are freely given to him of God, he may, without extraordinary revelation, in the right use of ordinary means, attain thereunto. And therefore, it is the duty of everyone to give all diligence to make his calling and election sure, that thereby his heart may be enlarged in peace and joy in the Holy Ghost, in love and thankfulness to God, and in strength and cheerfulness to the duties of obedience, the proper fruits of this assurance. So far is it from inclining men to looseness. So again here, just very briefly, this is saying that though it's infallible, in the sense that it's based infallibly upon God, 
we may experience our salvation um, in, in different ways. We may, ex- we may have difficulties in experiencing it. Indeed, it may be revealed to us later in life. So that first phrase there that I want us to highlight is the true believer may wait long and conflict with many difficulties before partaking of, of this assurance. The psalmist is a great place to go for, for these because we know the psalms are God's inspired word. We know that the psalms were sung by God's people, written by God's people, but yet listen to the words that they're, they're saying. Psalm 77, verses 7 and 9. Will the Lord reject forever? And will he never be favorable again? Has his loving kindness ceased forever? Has his promise come to an end forever? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Or, or has he in, in anger withdrawn his compassion? So here the psalmist is experiencing in, in, the, in the temple world this uh, almost like he doesn't feel assured of his salvation. He doesn't feel assured of God's work and presence in his life. So he's, he's falling short of partaking in that full assurance. But yet we know that he is redeemed. We know that he is indeed one of God's chosen. But in that moment, he is struggling to feel it. Again, in Psalm 88, verses 13 to 18, the psalmist says, But I, O Lord, have cried out to you for help. And in the morning, my prayer comes before you. God, I've been praying to you. I've been, I've been crying to you every morning, every day. I bring before you, O Lord, why do you reject my soul? Why are you not answering my call? Why do you hide your face from me? I was afflicted and about to die from, you, from my youth on. I suffer your terrors. I am overcome. Your burning anger has passed over me. Your terrors have destroyed me. They have surrounded me like water all day long. They have encompassed me altogether. You have removed lover and friend from me. My acquaintances are in darkness. The psalmist feels left alone. The psalmist feels reject, rejected, dejected, dishonored by both God and man. And yet, in that moment of that feeling unassured, we know and we can see again that he has been redeemed. And actually, the next psalm talks about the praise and loving kindness of God's, uh, of God's steadfast love. And so again, the psalms are a great place to see that even in scripture, there are redeemed people who are are born again, if you will, people who are the elect, who do not have a full grasp of their assurance. The next phrase, yet being enabled by the Spirit, he, the the assured, may without extraordinary revelation, in the right use of ordinary means, attain assurance. So first of all here, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. And so it's the spirit who who enables us, who shows us, who allows us, who invites us to have this assurance of our salvation because we don't have a spirit of the world We're not led by the sinful desires that are out there. We're not led by the the evil machinations of Satan. We're led by the Spirit, because the Spirit is from God. And we may know the things freely given to us by God, because God is gracious. God is quick to forgive. God is adopting. God, all the things we've talked about leading up to this are, again, acts of God or initiated by God. And the Spirit is the one who shows us, tells us, that these things are happening. Again, 1 John chapter 4, the apostle says, God has given us his spirit. That is how we know that we are one with him, just as he is one with us. It's the spirit who tells us these things, not some special or extraordinary revelation. The, the Westminster divines are also combating any error that there is some sort of special secret revelation that's, that's coming out there. No, the Holy Spirit in God's word tells us We don't need to invent something. We just listen to what he's saying in the scriptures. And so what he's saying is giving us the ordinary means of grace. Ephesians chapter 3, Paul says that he would grant you, according to God, that God would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith 
that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Again, it is his spirit who tells us and shows us how we receive and assure our faith. How it is through the means of grace that Christ is dwelling in your hearts. That God is, is, that you are rooted and grounded in his love. That you're able to comprehend. The very fact that we're able to even understand this is, is a means of grace, is a means of our assurance. That we're able to know that the, what the love of Christ is that we can read it in the scriptures and know what that love is, that we can experience that love in our lives, uh, that we may be filled up to the fullness of God. Um, that is how, again, part of the ordinary means of grace. The ordinary means also include our, our regular prayers, our, our listening uh, to, to Bible preaching, uh, fellowshipping together. Um, all, the, the means of grace are, are wide and varied, but God has given them to us, not as some special extraordinary revelation, but as the ordinary way of experiencing and coming to see our assurance. So if you love to go to church, let me just, I'll just say it this way. If you love the fellowship, if, if, if this is something that you, you, you find actually invigorating, that you, you, this is something that, the, that you, you feel you're renewed when you come to church, when you have this fellowship, when you listen uh, and pray, that's a sign of, of assurance. That's a sign of the spirit uh, assuring and, and, and building up. If you leave church bored, if you leave church unrenewed, if you leave church tired or, or like, what did I get out of this? Either the preacher is really bad or you don't have the assurance of your salvation. Now, one of those could be true. I hope I'm not a bad preacher. <laughs> but, you know, that the, and it could be both that are present there. But if, if the preaching is good, if the preaching is sound, the preaching is, is solid, if the fellowship is, is spirit-filled, and yet people are leaving church feeling disconnected. There's something wrong there. And perhaps that's an opportunity for a believer to step in and disciple that person uh, to, to have an assurance of their salvation. Because it doesn't mean that they're not redeemed. It just means maybe they're here. They're saved and don't know it. They don't, they don't have an assurance of their salvation. They need that assurance. The next phrase I want to look at is, it is the duty of everyone to make his calling and election sure. This is why I said, this is where we want every Christian to be. We want every believer to know that they are saved, to, to have an assurance of their salvation. And here, going back to 2 Peter chapter 1, in verses 5, he's starting verse 5, he says, Now for this very reason also, applying all diligence in your faith. So he's talking about in your faith. Supply, more, excuse me, supply moral excellence. So be morally good, be, more, be morally right. Follow the, the, moral, uh, the moral code that is written in the word. Uh, be supply moral excellence and in your moral excellence, knowledge. So an understanding of God, uh, an understanding of, of his word. I talk about everyone, is, every believer is a theologian. We don't like that. We don't, we don't like to think that way. And unfortunately, that I think has led many Presbyterians to actually fall short of what we're doing. You know, for, for, for years, for decades, we, we hire ministers who go and have three years of seminary and, and they learn all the Greek and Hebrew and, and they're the theologians and they just, they just tell us about it. That's, I've been a, think, been a detriment to the church because now we've got hundreds, thousands, millions of people, maybe not quite now they've made that many Presbyterians, but we've got thousands of, of, of people in the pews who, who think they aren't theologians because they, they want their pastor to be the theologian. Let him think about the hard things and tell me what to believe. No, we are the theologian. Every believer is a theologian. Now, I'm not saying every believer is, needs to be a PhD in philosophy. No, not, that's, that's a calling. And not everyone has that calling. But everyone, if you're a believer, you have to know God. You have to come to a knowledge of God. Uh, and how do we know that God? We, of course, know him through, uh, through his word. So we have to have a knowledge in your, and in your knowledge, says Peter, self-control. All right, so now that we know God, now we know that what God wants, now that we are many theologians, if you will, now we have to respond. We have to uh, do something with that knowledge. And we have to be self-controlled with that knowledge. We have to recognize what our duty is to God. And we have to do it. And of course, that takes self-control. And so in your self-control, perseverance. It's going to be hard. 
It's going to be hard to, to, to want to follow God because one, you have your flesh and you have sin pulling you in this direction. So, you know, you've got your, your worldly friend saying, oh, but you can come on and hang out over here. It's just one, you know, whatever it is. You, you got temptation. And then you also have that God says some pretty hard things that sometimes we have to try and struggle with wrapping our heads around or something that, that is offensive to our sensibilities. And yet God tells us this is the way it is. And we have to struggle with that. And so we've got both, both those things pulling at us, which is why it takes perseverance within that self-control. And in your perseverance, godliness. So when we are persevering, we must be godly in that struggle. We must recognize what it is that God wants. Thankfully, the Holy Spirit, if he's truly in you, has given you a new will, a will that wants to please God. And so as we listen to that spirit, and as we listen to that will, we begin to follow in godliness, which is what God wants. That's how we are pleasing to God. Now, if we ignore that will, then we're not doing things that are godly. We're doing, as Paul says, ungodliness and unrighteousness, and God's wrath falls upon all those who do that. And in your godliness, brotherly kindness. Now, this is also important. First of all, we have to recognize that we are all trying to live this godly life. And we're all at different stages, just as we all might have different levels of assurance. And so we must be kind to our brothers and sisters in the faith, recognizing that perhaps someone who, who might appear to us as weaker, perhaps they are, they're, they're struggling. Well, that's our opportunity to step in and perhaps lend a hand, to, to be kind to them. And when people do fall, because we all fall, we must be kind and quick to forgive, to offer the hand, to, to invite repentance. We can't just shun and, and, and demand that, uh, that uh, this, you know, uh, a person just completely and totally ignore everything that's going on. No. We must work together and shepherd one another. That's part of being brotherly kindness. And in your brotherly kindness, says the apostle, love. This love that is self-giving, outward focus, never selfish love. It's love that is wanting and willing to help those who are struggling to shepherd through. Therefore, brethren, in verse 10, he says, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, so what we just talked about, you will never stumble. So that sense of, that's gonna be part of our assurance. If you're, if you're working through these things, if you're striving, if you're persevering, if you're struggling through these things, you can be assured. If you're practicing these things, you can be assured of your salvation. Um, and so that's, uh, and then he, the Westminster Vines go on to explain what the proper fruits of assurance are. And there's three of them. The first is peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. So God, through Christ, brings us to peace with God. Remember before, we're children of wrath, we're, we're sons of disobedience. And now, through adoption, we are in a, in a peaceful, reconciled relationship with God. And that same reconciliation is to be extended to others. It's the reason why Jesus says uh, to, to Peter, how often do I need to forgive? You forgive your brother uh, 70 times 7. You know, or, and why at the end of um, the, where Jesus gives us in Matthew 6, the Lord's Prayer, uh, forgive us our trespasses, we forgive those who trespass against us. Jesus goes on in the next verse to expand, if you do not forgive, God is not going to forgive you. So there's this recognition that there's this reconciliation that is also, because we've been reconciled with God, we also will be reconciled, must be reconciled through others. And again, this comes through joy and peace in the Holy Ghost. That's one fruit of our assurance. Another fruit of our assurance is the love and thankfulness to God. First John chapter 1, verse 6, if we say that we have fellowship with him, meaning fellowship with God, Yet, walk in the darkness, we lie, and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. And so we have, we have to have a love and thankfulness 
for God to God. And that is an assurance of our salvation. If we don't love God, if we're not thankful for what God has been doing, if we say we have fellowship with him, but yet we continue, as John says here, to walk in the darkness, then we're lying. If we continue to want to seek after sin and are unrepentant when we have sin in our lives, and yet we claim to be Christians, we claim to love God, we're liars. And that's not a good thing. And so we, we must, again, have this love and, and thankfulness for God. And when we do, we recognize that that is the assurance of our salvation. And the third fruit of assurance is this, strength and cheerfulness of obedience. We want to, we love to obey. We love to follow his commands. Titus chapter two, Paul says, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously in God. That's the command. That's the instruction to deny ungodliness, to deny worldly desires. But not just that. We can't just deny those things. It's one thing to deny those things and just not do anything else. We must deny those things and live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. So those who are called by God, who are purified by God as a people for Christ, they are zealous for good deeds. We are zealous, we're supposed to be zealous for wanting to do what is pleasing to God. And again, that is a fruit of our assurance. Right, we got five minutes in one article, last one. So the fourth article says this. True believers may have the assurance of their salvation diverse ways shaken, diminished, and intermitted, as by negligence in preserving it, preserving of it, by falling into some special sin which wounded the conscience and grieved the spirit, by some sudden or vehement temptation, by God's withdrawing the light of his countenance and suffering utterly destitute of that seed, excuse me, and suffering even such as fear, fear him to walk in darkness and to have no light. Yet are they never so utterly destitute of that seed of God and life of faith, that love of Christ and the brethren that sincerity of heart and conscience of duty, out of which, by the operation of the Spirit, this assurance may in due time be revived, and by which, in the meantime, they are supported from utter despair. So there's two sections in here, and there's, the first part has five, um, what, what are sort of, you know, the, the assurance may be shaken, diminished, and, and intermitted. So our assurance might be, like I said, subjectively experienced, as really low. We might not even feel assured of our salvation. And so the Westminster Divines list five ways here that that can happen to us. One is by ne negligence in preserving. Uh, now we will talk about what I'm about to say in Ephesians chapter five. We're going to talk about that when we get to marriage in chapter four. So right now, don't, don't listen to the marriage part, but I want you to listen to the, ne the neglect part. So in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 20 through 28, Paul says, Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that we might he might sanctify her having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands also ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. So ignore the marriage part, because we'll talk about that when we get to chapter 24. Right here, one of the, the ways of, that we might fall short of our assurance is if we neglect our duty in this example for husbands and wives to love each other. If we fall short, if we neglect that, we can neglect and actually fall short of our assurance. But Jesus, Paul very clearly says here that wives are to love their husbands and husbands are to love their wives. And if we neglect those duties, and there's many other commands, I just pointed out this one. If we neglect those things, 
that will make us feel less assured. We will have, as we continue to neglect, we continue in those sins, we will feel less and less safe or less and less assured of it. So negligence is one. Two, by falling into some special sin. So that's one way that assurance may be shaken, diminished. Um, here, the example of Peter, and we talked about him before. And Peter remembered the word which Jesus said, said, before rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. In that moment, Peter fell into a special sin. You know, he was, he's always been one of the redeemed. We know that he's one of the redeemed. We know that he's regenerated and saved. We, we, he has the assurance. He's been elected and called. And yet in that moment where, you know, Jesus was arrested, he fell into sin. He denied Jesus. And what does Jesus say earlier? Those who deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father in the heaven and the angels who are in heaven. And so here we see that Paul has done, or Peter has done that. Peter has denied Jesus three times before men. Of course, you know, Jesus uh, predicted and told him. But here we see that he fell into a special sin. And, in, and, you know, in that moment, he probably felt, oh, goodness, what did I do? And he goes out and weeps, wept bitterly. Those are bitter tears of, of recognizing that he, he fell short. And I, I imagine in that moment, he probably doubted his own salvation. Uh, okay, of course, we'll talk a little bit later about what Jesus does in Luke. But the third, third way that our assurance can be shaken or diminished is by God's withdrawing his light. So 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul says, uh, And he has said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weakness, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. And so when we see that God is, is drawing you know, his light away from us, that's a way of bringing us down. What, what is pleasing to God? What's a sacrifice that's pleasing to God? It's a broken and contrite heart. Now, how are we going to break? How are we going to have it? We don't like breaking our own hearts. We're not going to have a contrite heart on our own. God has to humble us. God has to bring us low. God has to weaken us because if we're self Strength, you know, if we're boasting in our own strength and our own power, then we're not going to trust in God. And so God will withdraw his light from us sometimes so that we can be brought low, that we can be humble, that we can recognize that we need to rely on him. And as Paul says here, he knows that his weakness, in his weakness, he can see and experience the power of Christ that dwells within him. And the fifth way uh, this... Uh, this article works, is that believers are never so utterly destitute of the seed of God that assurance may in due time be revived. So the assurance will be revived. We may at those moments feel like we're not saved. And here's where we get back to, to Peter. In Luke chapter 22, here uh, Jesus again talking to Peter. This time he's giving him the warning of his denial. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And you, when once you have turned again, so returned to Christ, strengthen your brothers. And so those who are truly redeemed, those who are truly the elect, when, whether by our own fault or by God's you know, turning, withdrawing his light from us, those are ways that we can supposed to be ways that we return to him. We recognize that we need to rely on him, recognize that we must trust in him, and that will assure us again of our salvation and revive that assurance in us. Micah, again, the prophet says in chapter 7, Do not rejoice over me, O my enemy. Though I fall, I will rise. Though I dwell in darkness, the Lord is a light for me. I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him until he pleads my case and executes justice for me. He will bring me out to the light and I will see his righteousness. So here Micah says he's experiencing that, that condemnation from God because he's turned. He's, he's experiencing this, um, the judgment of God. And he doesn't want the enemies to rejoice over that because it's not that he's doing bad in the sense that you know he's unredeemed. He's being... Uh, again, God's, when God punishes us, it's not retributive justice. It's for restorative. God is restoring Israel. God is restoring the church. When God uh, will, you know, like I said, 
sometimes will leave us when our assurance is low, we must remember that God is the one who actually gave us that assurance, who gave us that salvation. And so we, we recognize that. When we recognize that, we are revived. Our assurance can be revived. So again, that's the whole point of being here. Every Christian should be here. And that's, and that's how we keep our, one, another, one another there. We support one another. That's why we have the church. Uh, the, the assurance of our salvation, just in conclusion, it's a synergistic work. Remember, justification, our salvation, is monergistic. It's, it's something that God does, not something we do. But because it's something God does, it's objective. It's there. It's a reality. It's the state of grace. The assurance, along with you know, good works and other things, that's synergistic. Because of that, it's naturally subjective. And so we, as Christians, support one another. We fellowship together. We help one another through this process of the assurance of our faith. Um, this is why, one of the reasons why we come to church. This is one of the reasons why I don't think you can be uh, an individual, you know, a, a Christian who doesn't go to church, who says, you know, I'm spiritual but not religious type thing. Well, how can you have assurance of your salvation if you're not fellowshipping, if you're not uh, growing, if you're not learning? We need, to, we need the church because the church is how we get to this point. It's through, and I'm not talking specifically about the physical church, but I'm talking about the family, the body of Christ, uh, the gathering of believers, that we can fellowship together and help one another be assured and grow in that assurance. Any questions? We're over time, but did a lot of talking there. It might not necessarily, it might just mean, you know, you're saved and don't know it, or, or there's, there's still maybe another indwelling sin. You know, if you're a Christian and you do something begrudgingly, that's the opportunity for you to, for maybe not you, but for the Christian to step back and say, well, why am I begrudging? Why, why, why am I hurt in, in wanting to do that? And that's the opportunity for us to examine our life. And again, if we're a Christian, we will come to the point of realizing, oh, well, well, I'm doing this begrudgingly because there's maybe another sin or something else in me or something that I don't understand, and I need to fix that, I need to get rid of that, I need to turn that over to God before I can really, truly love obeying that command or, or whatever. So again, the, but that would, that's the thought process of the Christian, of the, of the believer, I should say. Um, the the non-believer who might be coming to church, maybe the unsaved and don't know it, you know, they're coming to church and they, and they hear the commands and the rules and all these things. And because God puts rules in our lives, don't ever think Christianity is not about rules. Christianity is about rules. They're God's rules. God has given them to us. God wants us to live a particular manner in a particular way. And if we are unsaved and don't know it, and we come and we hear those rules, we're like, oh man, why do I want to listen to this? And then you, you recognize, say, maybe what, there comes a moment, you, you won't even examine why you want to do it begrudgingly. You just probably, an unsafe person would hear that over and over again, Sunday after Sunday, especially if they're in a, in a, in a good you know, Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church, they're going to hear that. Hopefully, they might come to a point of recognizing that maybe they're actually here and don't know it. But if they're unsafe, they're just, they're going to leave because they, they will either try and find loopholes or they'll leave, which is why, again, it's, we, we, we have to be careful and not to put people like who are unsaved in positions of power because then they'll try and change the church. And that's not a good thing either. But the unsaved, they won't examine their life. They won't even examine why they're thinking that way. The believer, when he or she is struggling with sin or, or struggling to obey, should rightly examine, all right, well, why am I, why am I struggling with that? What is it that, that I don't understand? And then change it. That's the other thing the Christian, the true believer does. The true believer changes his or herself. The true believer doesn't try and change God, doesn't try and change the Bible, doesn't try and change the, the church. The true believer changes himself or herself. They change what, they, what is wrong in their life to align with God. Again, that's something the believer does. If the, the unbeliever, say they get to that point, they won't want to change. They might even harden their heart even more and say, no, I, this, is, this is who I am. This is the way I was made. This is what I do. God, you can't change me. You can't ask me to do that. That is the attitude of an unredeemed person. 
Now, I'm not saying, you know, we can't do anything. We should. We should approach that person, hopefully. Maybe, hopefully, they're actually here and they don't, they're saved and they don't know it. And they're just acting unredeemed. Which is why we must always, I think the Christian, especially in churches, we need to be thinking this way. That the people who come into the pews are saved and either they know it or they don't know it. And so we're there to help shepherd them through it. But in that shepherding, in that discipleship, we come to find out that that person really is unregenerate. That's the reason why Jesus gives us the, the um, discipline in Matthew chapter 18. If a person continues in that sin and we approach them and address them time and time again, and they are unrepentant about that sin, that is, is evidence enough to, you know, theological language, excommunicate them, to put them outside the church, because if they are in the church and they're perpetuating that unrighteousness, that can actually be a detriment to the unity and purity of the church. And so we set them outside the church, not out of you know, meanness, not out of malice, but one, to preserve the peace, unity, and purity of the church, but also to, to allow them an opportunity to be outside, as, you know, to, to experience the darkness of God, you know, the, 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 that God is withdrawing his light from them, that they're not in the fellowship here. And they'll either recognize that they are saved and didn't know it, and they come to repentance, or they're unsaved and they don't know it, and they realize that they are unsaved and they know it and they never come back. And that happens. And that's okay. We need to be okay with that. That was a long answer to your question, but <laughs> did I answer your question? <laughs> I know, I sort of so went around. Do you want to try again? Or <laughs> are there any other questions? All right, well then let me close with prayer. Heavenly Father, first of all, I do want to thank you so much for um, this doctrine of salvation, the doctrine of grace. Lord, we know that it is a monergistic work. You're sovereign in everything. You're sovereign in all respects. You are sovereign in our life, in our salvation, and in our faith. And Lord, that should bring us joy and happiness because we know that if it were on our shoulders. If our salvation were truly our responsibility, I can speak for myself, I know that I would fall short. I know that I would never do it. I know that I would not be saved. And so God, I am thankful and grateful for your work, for your call in my life and the life of those gathered here today. Lord, I pray that wherever we are in the assurance of our faith, because I'm sure we're in many different stages, Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit continue to reveal to us, open up our eyes and our hearts to hear and respond to the assurance of our salvation, that the state of grace that you have called us to is objective, it's true, it's real, and that we can assent to it, that we can respond to it. And so I pray for his help, his guidance in our life, the guidance and fellowship of this community, that we can help one another not, never shunning, never shutting the doors, but inviting over and over again, calling for repentance, calling for a turning and a returning to you as the assurance of salvation. We pray all this in Jesus' name.